Welcome to the Power Cat Podcast, presented by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Now let's go to the Rolling Flint Hills, home of the Cats and Dogs Studio. Here's your host, Tim Fitzgerald. You know what? I meant to take off my sweater. We're starting a whole new podcast. I was going to give it a new look. Plus, I'm getting hot. Did I remember to do it? No. Am I going to do it on camera? No, I don't want to. I don't want to get the adult rating on YouTube because it'll be so sexy. Tim Fitzgerald, Cole Carmody, Ryan, Ryan Gilbert, Jesus, Ryan Wallace. Man, it's just not easy. It's it. You get old and everyone just mushes together right here in the cats and dogs studio. Well, Wally is, and he's, he's in that secret studio uh, in his basement of his laboratory. His house, his house. Uh, we're sponsored by the fridge wholesale liquor. Uh, I hope you're coming to town Saturday for basketball game. Uh, just go through there and, you know, check out the store. If you've never been in, just swing by, uh, check it out. Maybe you'll find some deals you like. They always got great deals and they always have an incredible selection. If you're a bourbon person, uh, go in there and ask their questions. And yep, there, there's one right there. Uh, they've That's got me. some great, great stuff locked away. If you really want some good bourbons. Uh, and if you're a vodka guy, like I'm kind of both now, um, you know what? They they know their vodkas, their flavored ones. They they know they've got recipes. They've got crawlers they can make of their own beer. I, I don't understand Kansas liquor laws now. They're just winging it. We're going to get home delivery here pretty soon. Wow. I don't know what's going on in this day. We're getting crazy. We're getting crazy. So like it. come to town, go to the fridge, mm-hmm. go to the basketball game, mm-hmm. uh, drink your booze before the basketball game. Right. Um, drink water inside of the game and then drive back from the game to Kansas city uh, for an eight o'clock women's basketball game. Oh, very valid. Very valid. And keep the booze from the fridge and get the hotel room in Kansas city, stay in Kansas city, drink the booze that night and the next day when the women play, uh, hopefully in the semifinal round. What are you doing teaching? You should be a life coach. I'm, I I'm, loved that. Just saying. That was um yeah, I kind of want to do it now. <laughs> Except I need to nap. It's just a sad you can't do existence. two basketball games in one day. No, huh. I've got nothing in the tank. I'm just a sad old man. <laughs> there, there might be another cause. I'm just not going to talk about it. Hey, um, so if you missed out, uh, there was a whole nother podcast yesterday. Well, there was a podcast yesterday. Yesterday, we did the basketball one, and then we were going to meet and do the football one, and we got into it. And uh, I, I'm going to say they're they're very knowledgeable. That, that's my way of saying they talk a lot. Mm. They're very knowledgeable, these two guys with me. And, and we were pushing 40, 45 minutes, only doing about half the show. So I thought, hey, I'm the boss. Let's call an audible. And here we are for uh, number two, um, which isn't that. It's not number two. It's 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 a full. It, never mind. Uh, let's get going here. Uh, these are just kind of catch all questions. Uh, Zach Carlson organized these for us, and there were so many questions about individual position groups, and he lumped them all in together. Let's talk about the offense. Who stands out? Who are you excited to see? Which position group needs the most work going into the twenty four season? Um, and if you saw the first one, we kind of covered this a little bit, but I'm with Wally. I, I want to see that offensive line uh, really kind of come together like the Beatles uh, and, and, you know, some cohesiveness. Wally, Connor Riley has benefited from inheriting a lot of nice pieces that were around for a long time. And I think he's genuinely fired up to reinvent this thing and we'll see what happens. But for me, it's the line. Yeah. Do I want to see who pops up at receiver? How the t- even younger tight ends are talking about other tight ends mm-hmm. be- between o- beside Oakley and Swanson You know, who's going to be that backup running back? Those are all interesting things for me on offense. But if you're bad at the line, you're going to struggle. And that's kind of the point you made in yesterday's podcast. Yeah. So I think, you know, if we're talking about the the position group that I'm watching the closest, um, it has to be offensive line. And I'll start by saying there's nobody that I trust to develop and get guys ready at a position more than Connor Riley. Yeah. I mean, he's... They're going to figure this out, how long it takes, who knows, but he's going to get the right guys out there and they'll be, they'll be dominant. You know, I think at some point this season, is it going to be the end? Is it going to be the beginning? That's what time will tell. But, you know, the one thing that we were preaching for last year was to get a little, some of these guys a little bit more rep and it didn't happen in the fall. I I hope that doesn't come back to bite K-State a little bit Agreed. because I'm with you, Fitz. I, I think, We've been hearing some buzz for a while now about 
how much K-State really liked the young linemen. They just weren't quite ready yet. Well, now is their time. I mean, now the the Andrew Lang gang, the John Pastores, the uh, I mean, even you know Sam Hecht. Um, you know, they just put they put Alex Key on scholarship. I think he's done some mm-hmm. nice things. Um, Drake Beckwith still light, but a guy that they loved at camp. That's just again yeah. taken the right path, even if he's not quite there yet. But I mean, like you said, Fitz, it's. It's not only, you know, how quickly can these guys get ready? Um, they're really athletic for an offensive line, but, you know, can they get the muscle mass? Can they can they do some of the things on, on the ground game? But also, fits again, another thing that I would love to see in spring, but we're so limited on, on what we can see, we might have to, you know, kind of fish it out from the sourcing if we can, is, you know, does Connor Riley's involvement with them change at all? I don't think it will in the spring, but mm-hmm. at the same time, he's this is kind of a test run for Saturdays in the fall. Yeah. How much of Vincent Johnson is more hands on, and and is there any you know impact from that? But it to me, it, Cole, it's got to be the offensive line for me. It just has to. Let me point out, uh, in case Cole and I were making faces, we got hot boxed by a dog <laughs> during Wally's answer, and it's not good. It's not good at all. No, just talk, make words. So, um, you brought up. Vernie Johnson. And I want to talk about him real quick before I answer this question. So we get a chance during bowl prep to go to the practices and you get to see how the coaches interact with players. And the thing that has stood out to me every single time, even including at camps, anytime you see Vincent Johnson, who they call Vinny, the GA, I, he is a relationship builder. Vinny, the GA. I love him. Man. <laughs> yeah. He is, he is a relationship builder. Right. Like that is what he does. And so I'm, I'm sure he's really good at the X's and O's. I haven't interacted him with him a ton, but I know that that is a guy who they really like and who is going to have to take another and a bigger role into this offense. But he is a relationship builder. And so when you can kind of build that trust, um, not only is he have a relationship with the kids, but he also has a relationship with the rest of the offensive coaching staff. And so I, it wouldn't shock me to see him have, quite frankly, a bigger role than maybe a lot of other GAs, especially with Connor Riley being the first year offensive coordinator. Uh, but to answer the question, the position group I'm looking at is the cornerback room. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ooh, we're, good. We're, we're on offense. You said corner or quarter? Do, are we talking just off? Well, offense? yeah. Okay. Save that one for later. Cause I like that. Okay. Yeah. That we're doing offense. The next one's Sorry. defense. Quit. Follow the rules. Young man, just because someone napalm the room. I, I, was it dude or Daphne? I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't hear a thing. It smells like deviled eggs. It does. It's bad. <laughs> um, I'll answer. Th- then if I can't say cornerback, I will say quarterback because everybody loves the backup quarterback. Uh, yes. Who is it? Yeah. And I mean, so that is kind of, a, I, I mean, Wally, you might be able to answer this question. In an ideal world, would K-State want Blake Barnett to be the backup quarterback by the time the fall? No. Is no. Jacob Knuth. It'll be Jacob Knuth, at least early. But right? ideally, would they want a guy like Blake Barnett if he is as talented as they say? Is that a guy who they want to be like the Avery, who is number two and ready to go and step in if Avery gets hurt? Or is it a situation to where if a helmet pops off, Knuth is going in, but if it's a long-term injury, maybe they'll roll with a guy like Blake. Not early in the season. He's going to miss the entire spring, right, Wally? Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I think... I think he might be out of a boot, guys. I think he's – I don't know if he's back full running, full contact, but I think he's out – we're out of the boot. Oh, well, that, that kind of changes things. I think the strong preference is to redshirt him. Um, but let's be honest. Uh, the, as far as I know, the other quarterbacks don't really replicate what Avery does. They they would be back into trying to do something else. I don't know. Look, I Jacob Knuth, maybe he runs around – nobody's as fast or as elusive as Avery, but maybe they could, but Blake is a running throwing quarterback. He's, he's built different. He's a, you know, a lot thicker. Um, but so maybe if you got late in the season, let's say you're in week nine and down he goes and you're in the mix for the big 12 championship game. Maybe at that point you go with it or do you stick with what's known? Even if it's not that known. It's it's in, intriguing to me that the rebuild of the back part of the quarterback room, I think it's a big story that we're all kind of the, the big shiny object named Avery is blinding us from the importance of that. 
to make sure you're ready to go depth wise. So it is Avery Johnson, Blake Barnett are the, and Jacob Knuth are the three quarterbacks on scholarship. And then you have, pr- help me with the pronunciation. Kellen, Kellen Samanchik. And I wouldn't, I'm, don't sleep I'm, I, on him. This is okay. So this is where I'm going with that, right? Don't like sleep this on is him. a veteran guy who has a lot of experience. I know he didn't play last year because um, he was, he was injured. If I'm tracking correctly, yes. Yes. Um, but he was honorable mention all conference in the MIAA, which is, a, come on. I, 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 I understand that, but this is a guy who has game experience. Um, he doesn't have no other quarterback in that room has any g- college game experience true. at all. So, yeah. I'm not saying that's going to be the backup, but he's going to be a guy who's going to push for the backup. That would spot. be one hell of a story. That's why I'm not willing to rule him out because I think if you're looking at a guy again, maybe this isn't like dire case. Dire case, I think he would. They're hoping probably for a Jacob Knuth for a Blake mm-hmm. Barnett. That yeah, if you have the the Skylar Thompson week two situation, you got to have somebody long term. You prefer that, but I'm I'm talking, you know, again, just kind of the end of game type scenario. I, I'm not, I'm not counting out Kellen Samanchik. He's a game manager. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's not going to, uh, I don't think he's going to put you in peril at all. And, and I, we don't know enough about Jacob Knuth to say that whether he would or wouldn't. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to rule out uh, Kellen Samanchik. I need to get on a texting chain with Matt Wells so I can get up to date updates on the quarterback room. They want somebody to be Cole Ballard. To steal from KU, yeah, exactly. if, yes. if one of those yes. guys can be Cole Ballard, it would, valid. it would work. How how important was he to KU? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, oh uh, one more thing. Going back to the uh, Vinny Johnson um, mm. topic, uh, Cole was spot on about relationship building. Guys, do you know who else is a big Vinny Johnson fan? Mm. No, Andrew Babalola. Mm. Oh, that's kind of important. Yeah, you just, will know the rankings by the time this podcast is out. By the way, just uh, right? you know. New, okay. newly crowned five star, mm-hmm. newly crowned five star. So, just throwing that out there. How long has it been since Kansas had two of those? Five stars. Uh-huh. Bryce Brown. Know. But there's two though in the state of Kansas, right? I don't think uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Cure, Cure, I believe, is is not quite there oh. yet. Oh, that's right. I keep thinking Lincoln's one, and he's very uh, he's very close. He's not quite there yet. We need to get Vinny, the relationship builder, to <laughs> talk to twenty four seven, or maybe I call him up in my Liam Neeson voice. Mm. I just really don't have one. Mm. Don't have one. That's it for the first half of this edition of the podcast. No, it's not. What am I doing? What are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing. You're supposed to read the second question, not the second. Man, I'm so tired. I've been down here for. I... Solitary. By solitary. the way, that that pause on the podcast, if you're just listening, was me staring at the camera with utter disappointment in myself. Now let's talk about the defense. Who Thank stands you. out? Who are you excited to see? Which position group needs the most work during the 24 season? Uh, you know what? I'm going to let Cole. I have a feeling Cole has an answer ready uh, on this one. I uh, do. Which what? What group stands out to you? I'm going to guess uh, you're going to say cornerbacks. You would be right. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm su- color me shocked. Honestly, I am very surprised they did not add another uh, player from the transfer portal in yeah. this room. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm very surprised. And maybe that comes in the summertime. They obviously believe in who they have. And the thing that I guess I'm a little, I don't want to say concerned because. I don't, I don't, I think that Van Malone is a really good developer, right? Like he has developed cornerbacks. He developed Jacob Parrish from a guy who was a fringe scholarship late addition, about as late as you can get to being a going to probably be a four year starter. Um, he's completely turned Keenan Garber in from a project of a receiver who couldn't get on the field, who was probably going to either transfer or quit football to a guy who now is going to be a two year contributor. Um, and he's he's done a lot for that room as far as development goes, but guys don't really stay around that often. And I, I don't know if that's because it, that cornerback room is typically older, right? They don't play a lot of young guys, you know, save Jacob Parrish. Um, but you look around and it's like somebody has to play. Right. Like Justice James, it's going to be his third year. I don't think that in an ideal world, Justice James should be the fourth or the fifth best cornerback, right? Like you should see a Kanigel Thomas. You should see a Donovan McIntosh, a Daryl Jones, 
But instead, you're going to see probably Justice James. And and I don't know if you'll see Tyler Nalome. I, I know that, Wally, when you did your feature on guys feeling the most pressure that you talked about Nalome is maybe this is a guy who might end up in the transfer portal. But, like, I just feel like it's Jacob Parrish and then – I guess you can say Keenan Garber and everybody else, but I'm almost to the point now where it's Jacob Parrish and everybody else. I think Keenan Garber is a fine player, but I'm not ready to say that he is an every down number two cornerback. And so I, I'm not worried. I am concerned at what that position. Is. Well, I think this is a spot that when the portal reopens that they might revisit. Yeah. That I, you know, we we forget that they're going to go through spring football and go. Yeah, we need we need that now. We'd let's go find it. If there's one out there that fits us, let's go get them. Um, but um, yeah, I get it. But I think I think Keenan Garber's pretty good. Mm-hmm. I I saw him do some things last year. I'm like, I cannot believe this kid who played receiver for three years was almost better at corner from day one, mm-hmm. and he's developed that much uh, in his ability to do things. And I like his speed. They got good speed at the corners, which helps. I don't know if you saw Wally, uh, as a guy who watches, this is the rumor, watches the combine. Uh, no wonder Xavier Worthy was hard to cover. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. 4 2 1. And Texas fans still wanted more from him. That's what's. Yeah. <laughs> still, still, we're not happy with Xavier Worthy. Um, but, but that's the kind of guy that exactly going back to the offense. That's if they could find someone that runs that four, three, oh, yeah. I mean that just having them out there messed with defenses. Maybe, maybe Trey Davis is that guy. We won't see him till the summer though. Um, Cole kind of took my, I mean, I, cornerback should have everybody's attention. I think this spring, because as Cole said, they kind of missed an opportunity to bring somebody in that was going to make people look around and go, man, I better step my game up. I mean, it, it is what it is. And like Fitz said, maybe that is a position that they'll look at, you know, again here moving into the into the summer after spring and, and the dust settles, so to speak. Um, so if I'm not going to take cornerback, I'm not going to take linebacker because they're deep there. Mm-hmm. But I think we've got some established names there. You know what I mean? I, I think at the, at the end of the day, you can kind of at least start to shuffle out what the two or three deep is going to look like. And I think for the most part, I would be surprised if that isn't kind of chalky. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm left with either, you know, going more D line, particularly defensive end or going safety. And I'm torn here. (laughs) I think I'm going to go safety. Oh, good. And here's why I'm going. And here's why defensive end is going to be interesting to watch because of what Chris Kleiman said about Brendan Mott and Cody Stuffelbeam being, being out, which means there's going to be a ton of spring activity for those guys that are kind of quote behind them as to who, how that shakes out. But why safety to me is so important as I'm scrolling up this roster here is the sheer number of guys that they have, but Fitz and Cole, somebody's going to come out of spring and not just somebody, maybe multiple feeling kind of unhappy Mm -hmm. with where they're at. And to me, this is prime grounds for transfer portal is at safety. You look at this position, you're bringing back VJ Payne, bona fide starter. You're bringing back Marquis Siegel, bona fide starter. They go out and they get a guy like Jordan Riley, who is immensely experienced. They also go out and get another veteran guy again from the Juco ranks but a guy that Chris Kleiman was already talking about this week in Dante Thomas. Strap. Strap. Thomas. Strap. Those two guys can be difference makers. You get Nikendra Steiger coming back from an injury who we didn't think, you know, had a shadow of a chance. And if you go back two years ago, he arrived in the summer and played in the season opener. Week so one. He yep. Can't be that bad. You've got Colby McAllister who they loved in bull prep. He's coming back. You look at a guy like Jack Fabris. He's back and played a lot in the bowl game. Oh they gosh. raved about Wesley Fair. They raved about Cam Salas. Daniel Cobbs has gotten on the field. They love what Mikey Bergeron brings as a preferred walk-on. And, oh, by the way, they've got Callum Barta, who came in on scholarship and was an early enrollee as well. And I'm not even mentioning 
a guy that's been in the system for years like Max Marsh or Trey Krause, who they've, you know, complimented at times here and there. So there is so much competition there. I don't know what order they're going to go with. I don't know how often they're going to rotate those guys. In the past, we've seen primarily it be three, maybe four, I guess five at times in the Big 12 championship season that, that kind of got some run there. They're, they can't – I don't know if they really want to go that deep and and that rotation heavy. Fitz, somebody's going to be unhappy. Uh, that the, To me, that seems like a position room by no fault of Joe Klanderman's. It, it's just going to see some activity, I think, in the summer. Or it sounds like somebody who might have a chance to play cornerback. Or maybe, maybe that. Someone, maybe, maybe there's some, somebody. Maybe someone might make that move. I'm not going to speculate on who it is, but I will tell you, obviously, Marquis Siegel did play a little bit of cornerback at North Dakota State. I don't know if that would necessarily be something they would do, but if yeah. instead of maybe hitting the transfer portal, they say, you know Switch what? Over. Yeah, yeah, you might you might be better off. Corner. Okay, Wally, uh, dial up those defensive ends. Okay, here um, we go. For me. Um, because I'm intrigued by this room, they're gonna ha they have to develop their Felix. There has mm -hmm. to be someone that's dynamic off the corner, and we thought Khalid Duke would be that, and it didn't really work out. And maybe it was just the positions they put him in. But I feel like they've got dudes that can be very explosive and dynamic off that edge. And then if they push Jonathan Banks out there and on run situations taking the Jaden Pickle route of a bigger guy that can go in and out. Um, I think they could be really fun at defensive end, but um, they've got a lot of candidates there too. You mentioned the guys that are out. So give me who they got. So you've got uh, Jordan Allen, <clears throat> athletic freak, right? Yep. Coming back. You've got Travis Bates, the FCS, uh, I yep. think honorable mention, all American from Austin mm -hmm. P. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got Ryan Davis who redshirted last year, but six four two fifty. I mean, he's, he's got, Things working for him in that regard. You've got our our boy, I think my breakout candidate, Chidi Obiizar. Uh, he'll be back. You've got Donovan Ryman, and you've got the guy that we all predicted it was going to happen, and it happened. 6'3", only 233, but Toby Osatsomni can absolutely get in the backfield. And and as you mentioned, Fitz, correctly, maybe they we see a little bit of Javon Banks there in the spring as well, just depending on the situation. Oh my gosh, I'm excited about the DNs. I, I think I think it's gonna be Jordan Allen. You said who's gonna be that that next Felix? I, I really believe it's gonna be Jordan Allen. I think it's Cheedy. And I, he he definitely could be that guy. But I look at Cheedy as a, a bigger guy, right? Like Jordan Allen, I'm gonna pull up the roster right now. Jordan Allen, what is he listed as? He's listed as 250. Cheedy right now is at 267. And so, first of all, huge for GD Obiizer, but well, he, they just put out video of him squatting. He is massive. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. unbelievable. So I don't know necessarily know if that's a guy who's going to be that get around the edge and get to the quarterback, but you look at his basketball background, it definitely, you know, says he can be that guy, but Jordan Allen, I, I, I absolutely loved his film coming out of high school. And I know that they are really high. And if you go back and you watch Chris Kleiman's press conference, he's the first person that they talk about with the defensive end positions and I understand that Brendan Mott is going to get the number one opportunity to be the starting defensive end but is there a realistic world in which he's not one of the best defensive ends not not one of the best two defensive ends skill wise on this team because if they want Jordan Allen and Chidi and Travis Bates and some of these guys to develop they have a higher ceiling than than Brendan Mott does I, I believe yeah. that oh I, I agree I think Mott's a guy that you know what you're gonna get Right. And, and you don't double him. If you've got someone on the other end, right. you double, then Mott becomes really dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not, he's kind of a tweener in the fact that you don't need to double him, but he, 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 if you leave him with a guy, he would just, he might just rip him apart and make him a, clown him. But again, he might go with, against a really big, long tackle that he can't handle. So maybe they'll go somewhere else. I don't know. I'm really intrigued. Again, as Ryan Wall said earlier, and, and Cole said, I think, uh, the depth on this program is so much better. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's always derailed Kansas State, is there would be a drop from one to two, and you'd notice it, then the two would get hurt, and your drop to three would be tragic. I mean, just horrible. You go back to the Baylor game and Colin Klein's senior season, everybody was so worked up. 
they just had a dramatic drop off from Zimmerman mm -hmm. to Barnett. That turned out to be a great player, but he wasn't ready. So uh, that is going away. And, and so many of the guys Wally just listed are from last year's recruiting class that the coaches last year were saying, we got 10 to 12 guys. We could play if we wanted to. Yeah. And I've never heard that about a K state recruiting class. Not once have I heard a coach say on just one, I haven't heard him say it for the entire roster, let alone one side of the ball. We got double digit guys that could help us out this year. Um, so I think that's really hopeful. I mean, I think that that puts them in a position to, to maybe muster through what could be, you know, a brutal season. I think the big 12 is going to be physical and it's going to be fun. Well, Let's getting back to okay, getting back to real quick to just to what you just said, I, I think that's maybe why I'm not as concerned about special teams entering this season hmm. as I think maybe fans might be, uh, and rightfully so, coming off the year that they had, because I think a lot of those freshmen last year could have been starters on special teams. They didn't want to unseat their red shirt. They ended mm -hmm. up doing it with Nigel Thomas. They didn't want to do that with a lot of the other guys that probably could have started special teams. Now those guys are are ready. A lot of the safeties that I mentioned would be badasses on special teams, and now you don't have to risk you know the, the red shirt with them. So I think you're going to get fits back more to starting caliber guys uh, on special teams, and it, yeah. it'll but they won't be starters. So it'll be the best of both worlds. Give me a, just give me a true return, man. Just, I caught the ball. This is where I'm going block. I mean, uh, just trying to read a hole on, you know, you might get your clock clean because they don't, they miss a block, but if they hit all their blocks, you're gone through the scene. Give me that. Just give me what, what's the new special teams analyst's name? Cause I already forgot how to say it. Catzer. 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 Those, what a perfect name for those Eastern a European coach. names. I can't handle them. The cats are. We'll be back after this break. We've got a really interesting topic. I don't know where it's going. It might be five minutes or we might talk uh, for the next three hours on it. We'll see. We, we don't know. We're just, I'm tired. I'm getting cranky uh, and I need a nap, but we'll be back. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Please visit the Fridge Wholesale Liquor, located at the corner of Claflin and Westport Road in Manhattan, Kansas. Welcome back to the show. Let's return to the Cats and Dog Studio. Welcome back to the Power Cat Podcast. I crack up every time I hear those breaks. Andrew, the main guy, is real. The ad guy is AI. And Andrew sounds AI, and the ad guy sounds real. It's crazy yeah. to me. AI is just freaking me out. Pretty soon, uh, you'll just drop all this information into AI, and I'll have a whole podcast with with fictional people. I don't know. Why? Kids cheat on assignments using AI, by the way. Well, hell yeah, I would. And it's really easy to tell. Is it? So if my kids are listening to this and they cheat on their assignment, just know I can tell. Okay. They're asking chat GPT to write yep. a something for them? Yep. Kids, you got to go in there and tweak it. You got to put it in your own words. Let it do the main work and then come. Anyhow, I don't want to teach kids how to cheat. I never did. Anyhow, let's get going again with the Power Cat Podcast. This is the fourth half as we did back-to-back -back podcasts. I, I, I love this question, but it's long and I have to read it. That's a challenge for me. Uh, but I don't know where we're going to go with this because it kind of is. Uh, let's just be honest, Cat and Kahlo. This is a little disjointed. It's like, mm. hey, I really like peanut butter and, and jelly sandwiches, but how about them Royals? You know, uh, both <laughs> topics, but we'll, we'll we'll sort it out. Let's put it that way. Many of us complained when outsiders said that the Big 12 football was all about Texas and Oklahoma and then the rest of us little sisters. We pointed out that Texas never won championships. Thanks for doing it as soon as you walked out the door. <laughs> and we owned, as in Kansas State, Oklahoma. But now they're both gone, and K-State is a favorite, according to Vegas, not pundits, to win the Big 12. This is a good thing, right? How many times has that happened in the past? It has happened. I mean, there were teams that were favored. Wally, don't ask me with my trash memory what years it was, but I know Colin Klein's senior year, I believe they were picked to win. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I'm doing background research. Continue. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to tell when you do research because you still are like, it's do your thing. I just want to say this. 
I think the fact that K-State and Utah are the favorites, KU's right on the heels, followed by Arizona, is really good for this conference. Why? Because the national pundits can't just say, oh, it's Oklahoma and Texas. That's been a fallback Mm -hmm. for lazy-ass reporters who don't want to do any research on anyone outside of the blue blood grouping. And now if you're going to talk about the big 12, you got to come with some knowledge. Our guy, Josh Pate at 24 seven does an incredible job. If you ask him a K-State question, he could answer it. If you ask him a Utah question, he could answer it. And not just with words like I use a lot and doing right now with actual substance. And I think it's going to force a lot of people to pay attention to Kansas state to delve deeper into Utah because now they have a different context and they're not going to be playing every game uh, at, at 10 p.m. Uh, let's be honest. A lot of these writers are out east and they don't they don't want to stay up and watch. I think this is really good. And again, I think because of the playoff, the entire measurement of who's good and valuable in college football has changed. Now it was almost impossible. TCU managed it. Cincinnati managed it. Two Big 12 teams, by the way, to get into that four-team playoff. At 12 teams, a lot of teams, we're going to have two or three Big 12 teams, depending on the year, sneak into that thing. And if it's the same couple teams, three out of four years, well, we might only get two years of this process. Mm. Uh, I think the pundits go, oh, now I know who I need to pay attention to. And they'll start digging into K-State and and other programs more more deeply. Uh, And that's the beauty of the Big 12, though. Uh, it could be anyone. We could be sitting here talking about all the teams at Vegas sinks, and and after year one, it's Houston and Kansas fighting it out. You just don't know. That's what I'm so excited about here. I mean, West Virginia, Iowa State, Oklahoma State Tech. Uh, it's just uh, it's incredible, and I just skip over other teams that are really valuable to this conference. I'm I'm excited about it, and I'm excited because now reporters around the country, the pundits. Don't get the chance to be that lazy in talking about the Big 12. They just don't. But they are being lazy, and I know you have the answer, Wally, so I'm going to be quick. Um, But I I do think there is a little bit of laziness involved, and you know, it's our job to come up with articles like projecting the 12-team playoff. I saw an article on our own network projecting the 16 playoff next year or 14 playoff you know field next year if it was an exit, right? I think all of that is... Um, did you, am I hearing things? What was that? I have, that's it. Sounded like somebody sent an email. That it, was, it did like that in the last sound. podcast. It's been doing this in every podcast and we have no idea what it is. The only things running through this are Wally's AirPods and our microphones. It's a ghost. Okay. Go, go. That was I'm, I'm freaked out. All I'm saying is you said that the Big 12 is going to get two or three teams in, maybe hopefully consistently. Well, instead of picking Texas and Oklahoma to just win the Big 12 every year, now the hot, now not even the hot take is just to project one Big 12 team in the 12 team playoff. Like, yeah, just uh, the Big 12, they're not going to be that good. They're going to beat each other. There's going to be one team that gets in. That is a concern. It's going to be so balanced. It's I, all going to be I teams agree. that are like, uh, let, me, let me get some reference if anyone from the national media listens to this put this in language they can understand Uh, maybe all like four teams are gonna be like penn state Mm -hmm. not quite good enough you know to be in the 14 playoff but they they can step in there that's what i love about the big 12 yeah there's no buys on the schedule i don't even think arizona state's a buy i don't understand why everyone's downgrading byu i see a lot of odds of them being last in the conference i i don't think that's going to happen they've got They've got men that are 39 years old. I uh, saw. I might be exaggerating. I saw. Well, this is this is what I'm talking about. Okay. I saw in one of those articles, and I don't remember when it was or what, it, but it was in the 14 team playoff. K State, they won the Big 12 and they did project them to win the Big 12 and they got a bye. And so uh, LSU was one of the teams that was in this year's LSU team. So the upcoming season, this year's LSU team, they're going to be good. They're not, I don't think they're going to be a, uh, I don't think they'll make the 12 team playoff, but they might be an eight and four SEC team. Okay. Beat the teams they should lose the teams they should lose to. They had them coming to Bill Snyder Family Stadium and winning that game. And there wasn't even a synopsis about it. It was just uh, uh, the 
the 12 seed is going to beat the four seed, you know, no questions asked and, and move on. Right. That's, that's what I mean. Like you could take K-State out and put Arizona and you could take K-State out, put Utah in, and that's what it's going to be. It's going to be, Oh, well, because they play in the big 12, they're automatically not as good as some of the teams in the SEC and the big 10. And I, I just, I don't agree with that's that. So that. that's what the bias is. That's what I love. Uh, the, the playoff will, will prove that. Right. I, I mean, again, the national media is so lazy. They still want to follow the, the, the talking point that look what happened to CC when they got in the national championship, they beat Michigan to get there. Right. You know, I mean, come right. on, just be, be intellectually honest about what you're talking about. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this Wally. I, I don't know where you're at on it, but I, I think there's an opportunity here for a Kansas state. You can't mess around. You, you better get going right now with everything well, going on in college football. You better get going right yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before I answer real quick, I went back. The 2012 preseason poll, where do you think K-State? Remember, this was the Colin Klein Big 12 championship here. Okay. I have no idea. I they, did, they, they got a first place vote. That's one me. And it put them sixth. Oh, really? <laughs> they, <laughs> they were preseason six. I When I looked at the poll, I started to remember that year. They had Oklahoma preseason number one, which remember that was the big upset that, that kicked off K-State season, so to speak. West Virginia was number two. Remember the Geno Smith, Tavon oh, Austin. Yeah, yeah, then it went that. Texas, Oklahoma State, TCU, and then K State. Here's my so, thing. Anyway, I have said this before, and I, I stand by this. The poll in the Big 12 preseason football is going to be so radically different because we are rid of all of the Austin slash Texas media. And I, look, everyone says when you go to the Big 12 media days, it's um, Texas has all these people around them. And every, yeah. Yeah. They had all the Dallas media, some Houston media, uh, certainly the Austin media, all crowded around them. Now, that media will still probably be coming, but now they don't have, oh, I got to go cover Texas. You know, I they don't have that anymore. And they don't they don't vote. Well, let's start with Texas at one. You know, there's no, that's not going to be on the ballot anymore. So they're going to actually have to work, which is, right. you know, let's be honest in our profession. That's I, I, I will attest to that. We don't like to work too hard. Well, and, and some guys you, do. You teed it up for me right there, because okay. I think the question, the, the, fir the first part of the question was, is this a good thing? Right. That K-State is picked. You know, if they're not number one, that this idea that they're going to be a top team to contend with in the Big 12 now. I, I say yes, and here's my reasoning why, is because, again, now that you don't have a Texas and an Oklahoma that are automatically preseason, and again, if you're preseason one or two in your conference, you are you're would assume you're top, what, 20, mm -hmm. top 15 preseason, you are giving, you're given more forgiveness as the season goes on. You lose a game, you, you're not, you know, plummeting outside the top 25 maybe you bounce from 13 to 20 or something like that or you go back to like the 2003 k-state team that started I, I pulled this up they started like what seventh they started seventh in the preseason poll obviously that was the year that they kind of hit a skid but then when they got back to nine and three they're the voters quick to bump them back up mm -hmm. because yep. again you talked about the laziness and and i think we're all guilty of it and i think fans who are mad at journalists for doing this, you do the same thing. If you were in the journalist shoes, you want your preseason poll to finish as close <laughs> to what you had. So That's if you point. have a chance to bump K state back up, you can be like, Hey, I picked them. I, I had them in my poll. They were number one. So I think it, it helps for K state and Utah going into next year, because I think the sec, the big 10, I think those are, I would assume, will be fairly chalky. The one that I think is going to have more variety when you think about the national polls and stuff will be the Big 12. And so, again, I think you're going to have those voters that pick K-State. They're going to want to help them in any way that they can. And so, if again, you kind of get that advance. It's kind of like, where's Zach Carlson when I need him? It's kind of like Formula One. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you, you give yourself better odds. You give yourself better odds at winning the race if you're starting closer to the front. And so it helped. Yes. It's a great thing for K state that they are starting closer to the front. I'm just fascinated with this conference. And, and as a plug here, that's, this is exactly why we started the big 12 insider show, because I don't think, 
I'm, I'm not trusting the national media to have these conversations about Big 12 teams. I mean, today we on well, they were recording this on what's it today, Wednesday. Yeah. Um, we had Jason Shear on from Arizona to talk about football and basketball. Um, these are conversations I don't trust the national media to conduct. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to do it on that podcast. We're going to talk about the teams and the trends and the topics and have fun with it. But um, yeah, I, again, though, the one thing I don't think changes about the Big 12 is that that school that you just don't, you know, is picked in, let's see, there's 16 schools now, 10th. Oh, yeah. yeah they're in the come week game 11. Yeah, they're they're still in the conversation for the title. Right. Uh, I mean, it was it was Iowa State this year. Uh, West Virginia. Gonna, West Virginia. West Virginia was picked last. Neil Brown was exactly right. He scolded everyone. Um, I, but that's the problem. Is it's oddly it's easier to pick maybe K State or Utah. It, depending on who you are, you'll pick one or the other as as the top team in the conference. It's harder to pick the last two teams. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? I mean, yeah. who do you who do yeah. you relegate to that? I I think Arizona State, maybe I don't understand the BYU hate. Baylor. Cincinnati. And yeah, I, I'd pick might go with Cincinnati, not because of anything about the school or the coach. players that coach. Yeah. That was a bad hire in my book. But um, yeah. Um, but I'm the bad thing is, is is Oklahoma gave you that measurement. Mm -hmm. Even Two years ago, when Oklahoma wasn't very good, K State outed them and beat them, and everyone started beating them. They were still like Oklahoma on ABC this week, and there's four and three or what? You know, come on! And you go on national TV and beat them, and they're like, "Oh, Iowa State's not bad at all." You, you don't have that measurement, so that is a problem to overcome. But the way you overcome that is you don't just get in the playoff; you win a game. You, you do beat LSU. You ooh. become that measurement. Yeah, you you're like, oh, yeah. we didn't expect them to win, and and I I just remember when Auburn came to town, ironically with UCF's coach Gus Malzahn, and and he said this was as loud and rowdy as any game in the SEC. He was genuinely shocked by what he encountered, um, and I think if the playoff works out, where Big Twelve schools get home games against some of these teams, you gotta win. You just yeah. gotta do it. I am intrigued, though, Fitz, to finish on this topic of yep. of um, how K State handles, um, because historically speaking, anyway, and may, Fitz, you might correct me actually, because I think Bill Snyder's early teams handled it fairly, fairly damn well. But in in recent memory, even in hoops, K State hasn't been great with the target on their back. They thrive in the underdog role. Right. And I, I think it's it's an it's a quicker fall from grace when you don't live up to expectations as opposed to the team that comes from nowhere. Right. And so it'll be it'll be interesting if this does if 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 as pundits are projecting it to kind of be a K-State Utah, you can always kind of figure those two teams will be at the top, swap out a couple more. How does K-State handle that? You know, and and living up to to those expectations. They will not be the the cute dark horse anymore. Adorable. I'm going with adorable dark horse. <laughs> uh, my favorite thing that's going to happen this football season is Utah fans who have looked down their nose at this conference. I've heard that I've read them on the Twitter machine making fun of going to quote college towns. Yes. Yes. That's what it's supposed to be. Uh, you know, they're used to going to Seattle and L.A. and you know, places like that, San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to Ames. But I hope they make the trips because I think there'll be a realization very soon for Utah fans. Holy crap, we're just like these people. We were never like those people. We're passionate. We yell loud. We drink a lot of beer in the parking lot. Well, sorry, BYU. I didn't mean to bring up a sore topic and we get after it during the game and we follow our team around the conference. I think it's going to be that, you know, that Batman and Robin meme where they're pointing at each other. Like, Hey, K state, you're us. Spider-Man. You know? Spider-Man. Thank you. Yep. Um, I'm just, why did I come up with Robin? Does Spider-Man look like Robin? That's a whole nother topic. We'll do a whole different podcast on that, but um, maybe they're the same person. Oh, anyhow, I'm a, uh, I'm just anxious to see, excited to see 
them realize, holy crap, this is kind of cool. This is, you know, they're not coming to Manhattan. I, I'm not sure what their schedule is. They've got actually a fairly forgiving schedule yeah. um, for a new team. But uh, it's, uh, I, I can't wait for them. I want them to go to Ames or Morgantown. I really want you know, Arizona State fans to go to Morgantown after what their former AD said. These are great places and great fans. And you won't be starved for fun at the tailgate. You're walking around in red and you're not OU or Nebraska in Manhattan, Kansas. They're going to love you. You're going to get a free beer and probably some brisket. I'm sorry. It's going to happen, but yeah, Fitz, they actually don't, uh, in 2024, won't have a lot to complain about in terms of the, yeah. the old school college. They, they go at Oklahoma state is the only, if you want to call it the, the, the Great original, title. um, their other, their other games are at Arizona state at Houston, at Colorado and at UCF. So maybe 2025, they'll get a true taste of the big 12. Yeah. But yeah, yeah go to Stillwater. Stillwater's fun, man. Stillwater's great. That is Stillwater's the paddles. A blast. Oh, oh my gosh. It's one of the oh, great, Stillwater. I think it's a great wow. football environment. Me and, and Rob Cassidy that, tore that place up. Players says that, what's that one place called? Eskimo Joe. Oh, here we go. Now, Zach. And we got to talk about Zach. Zach loves Eskimo Joe. Was it you that did that, Wally? The Eskimo Joe. Mojo. So what was, was that just... on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that's uh, it for the podcast we thank the fridge wholesale liquor if eskimo joe's was in town they'd get their liquor from the fridge let's be honest with it maybe they do now i don't understand liquor laws i think we've already covered that was that in this podcast or yesterday's i'm not sure but we're done with this podcast now i get to edit them and it's past my bedtime my wife just came in and stole the dogs i was beginning to worry that the dogs have been sleeping all night she just took them out of here because it was pill time oh we appreciate you listening. We've had fun podcasting. We need to do this like uh, twice a day, every day. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. We're done. Bye. This has been a GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street production. Please support this show by subscribing to this YouTube channel or follow us on your favorite podcast platform.